I would like to welcome here His, His Excellency Miyajima Akio, Ambassador of Japan in Poland. And we appreciate your presence, but the, our main guest is Professor Kitaoka Shinchi from the, uh, from, I will explain from here, from Japan for sure for the moment. He will have, we have a pleasure to hear his lecture, which is opening the lectures on the Japanese culture for the Faculty of Computer Science and Japanese Culture. I would like to tell the title of the uh, Professor Kitaoka lecture. It was uh, the political history of modern Japan. Professor Kitaoka Shinichi is a former president of the Japan International Cooperation Agency. Be before assuming this, pres this position, he was president of the International University of Japan. Professor career includes professorships in numerous prestigious universities and he was ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary. And deputy and de deputy permanent representative of Japan to the United Nations. Professor Kitaoka speciality is modern Japan politics and diplomacy. He is a professor emeritus of the University of Tokyo. He has numerous books and articles in Japanese and English, including the, I would like only mention two of them, two of them books, and there is a political history of modern Japan, foreign relations and domestic politics, and second, Japan as a global player. He received many honors and awards, including the Medal of Honor with Parp Ribbon for his academic achievement. Professor Pitaoka, I will be, before inviting you, I would like to ask His Excellency Ambassador Miyajima Akio to have a few, to have a few words. Uh, so I'm ambassador to Poland from Japan. I've been working here almost two years. I have enjoyed the, the, the life here in Warsaw, visiting places. I once visited the, the Kiev and Lviv myself when I was ambassador to Turkey. So I was really shocked at what happened the, 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 the 24th of February. And ever since that, I've been also trying to work uh, to, together with Polish people to help Ukraine. And today, that my best, one of the best and uh, the good friend, uh, the Professor Kitaoka, finally came here. And I'm very, very happy to, uh, to listen to his lecture here at the, the, this academy. It has a very, very unique tie with Japan and also JICA. I really do hope this uh, Professor Kitao's lecture is going to be very, very stimulating for you for your further study and also the, the new beginning of our friendship between Japan and Poland and the Ukraine. And uh, so with all the wishes, I would like to have the, the, the Mr. Professor Kitao to speak. Thank you. Sure. I'm going to speak here or here. Or. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, fine. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here in this beautiful country in beautiful season. This is my second visit to this country. The last one was uh, very, very many years ago, in 1991, September. At that time, your country was in a very difficult time of uh, transition from the social system to uh, a democracy. 
and then the economy was in a very difficult situation. I remember that I had to carry uh, these thick uh, bills, you know, to buy something. And then now uh, Poland has recovered fully. And then now uh, becoming a very important and attractive country. And then in this university, which was supported by JICA, uh, I'm very happy to see that uh, this uh, university is going on very, very well, attracting such uh, so many capable people like you. Then, uh, you know, this has something to do with my lecture here. Because, you know, when I came here in 1991, this was to see how the transition was going on. Then, uh, uh, at that time, I had many questions from the people here about uh, Japan's post-war recovery. How Japan could recover uh, quickly from 1945 uh, devastation. And also, uh, after that, uh, I was, uh, as was uh, explained, I was appointed to the ambassador to the United Nations. There, I had many questions from the ambassadors of developing countries, how Japan could modernize itself from non-Western background. That was almost a miracle. And then I believe that still Japan is the, the best, first and the best example of modernization from non-Western background. Nowadays, there's a kind of, uh, you know, development studies in the world. And then uh, many people go to UK to study uh, development studies. But I thought that, why don't you come to Japan? UK used to be the advanced countries from 18th century. And they exploited your countries in Africa and in many areas. Brother, why don't you come to, see, come to Japan and learn how Japan uh, stood up against the uh, Western power? And then that will give you, of course, Japan made a lot of mistakes, including the war, but still you can learn about the war, about the mistake, why you made a mistake, such and such. Therefore, uh, uh, you know, coming to Japan is a very good idea, and also uh, Japan should become the center of development studies in the world today. With this idea, I established a course, uh, which is called the Japan uh, Development Studies Program in JICA. Uh, JICA is a donor organization to developing countries. Then we have a system of inviting people, young people from uh, many developing countries to Japan. And then one of uh, the, uh, we have also a program to invite them to uh, allow them the opportunity to study in Japan's graduate schools, uh, probably mainly in English. So I just uh, uh, decided to give them to provide them the education on Japan's modernization, Japan's post-war recovery, and also Japan's ODA system, believing that those knowledge may support their development, their own development very much. And that's how I started this uh, uh, JICA Development Studies program, which was in 2018, which was strongly, which was uh, the 150th anniversary of Meiji Restoration. And then uh, I asked the support from uh, to uh, Prime Minister Abe, and he strongly supported us, and it, which is going on very well. And then it, this was very well accepted. And then there came from many countries that they are willing to have a small, uh, similar kind of thing in their countries, from uh, uh, King Abdullah of Jordan or President Kagame of Rwanda wanted to establish some small course or chair in their top universities. Then I started to uh, uh, establish a small chair where they can study about Japan's modernization, Japan's post-war recovery, and Japan's ODA in their countries. And we provide books, we provide DVD, and also we dispatch the special lecturers on some topics. And then uh, Poland is not a developing country at all, but still uh, Poland is one of the you know, friendliest countries to Japan. And also, uh, uh, I have, uh, I, I found uh, Ambassador Miyajima here, who is a very good friend of mine. So I just uh, 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 tried to come here, and uh, this is finally realized today. I'm very happy, uh, and I thank uh, all the people who prepared this program. 
very much. Now, I was uh, asked to speak about uh, uh, Japan's political history, but uh, that's too long. So I just wanted to focus on Meiji Restoration. And then, uh, but of course, if I have some more time, I'm ready to respond. Uh, in my lecture, I'm going to cover from the explanation of yellow political system, a political system before Meiji Restoration, and to the establishment of uh, you know, modern uh, Meiji constitution and the parliament. But I'm ready to speak uh, uh, briefly uh, on the topic after uh, that. Okay. The major restoration is in a narrow sense. It, this is a political change which took place in January 1868. Here you can see uh, uh, some people sitting. On the far end, there was a young Meiji emperor was sitting at the age of 15 or 16. And then at the bottom is the, you know, the starting of a parliament. You can see that it took only 22 years from the end of the Edo system to the opening of a parliament system. This is a kind of miracle. And then, therefore, I'd like to start with the explanation of a political system in Yedo period. A political system of Yedo system was started roughly in 1600, when the war was Sekigahara was won by Tokugawa Ieyasu, who was the founder of a Tokugawa Bakufu. Bakufu means a, a military government. And then there, were, there used to be Kamakura Bakufu or Muromachi Bakufu in the past, but this was called this was the longest and the strongest bakufu among three bakufus in Edo period. Then uh, in this system, this is a kind of feudalism. You know, in feudalism, there are feudal laws, and also on the top of the leader. But uh, the, the characteristics of this uh, feudal system in Edo period was that, you know, bakufu uh, took care of the national politics, and then uh, Han or feudal domains, which was around in the minimum time 260, in the maximum time 300. And then in the Han, uh, there was a uh, daimyo who was a feudal laws. But the biggest characteristic was that, you know, this was a kind of centralized feudalism, where central government was very strong compared to other feudal systems. Then uh, you can see them, uh, some places. You know, this is Edo, Tokyo, and uh, this is uh, Kyoto, where emperor used to live. Osaka is a, uh, was a commercial capital in Japan at that time. And as you may know, that uh, Kagoshima, Satsuma was an area where the strong feudal lord was living. The another feudal lord, strong leader, was living in here, Yamaguchi Prefecture, or at that time, it was called Choshu. This is the area where Prime Minister Abe was from. Uh, some other cities. Nagasaki was an opening window to Western civilization, where some Dutch people are allowed to live. The Nakatsuha is uh, not particularly important compared to other cities, but Nakatsuha was a uh, place where uh, Fukuzawa Yukichi was a leading public intellectual who did a great contribution to the modernization of Japan, was born here. Okay. Then the class system. On the top is the uh, samurai or bushi or uh, warriors. They consist of uh, roughly 5% of the population, 5%, including family, followed by farmers, craftsmen, merchants. Now they are just commoners. Farmers are uh, placed uh, uh, rather than uh, uh, over craftsmen and merchants. Because at that time, you know, rice production was considered to be very important. Therefore, farmers who create rice was considered to be important. But another important thing was that there's a distinction between upper class samurai and lower class samurai. The ratio was roughly one to three or one to four. And then upper class samurai are just elites, served by many servants. But lower class samurai, usually do not, did not have any servant. They had to do uh, everything by themselves. In that sense, they were 
uh, economically they are commoners. So of course they are rich farmers or rich craftsmen or rich merchants. But roughly speaking, the lower class samurai farmers, craftsmen, and merchants are just commoners. Then uh, in any feudal domain, uh, those who have visited Japan may know that uh, there are many beautiful castles. Each feudal lord is allowed to establish one castle. Uh, even if you are very strong, still you can establish only one. This shows a strong control from the central government. And they are very beautiful because they are mostly completed when the Tokuwa back was established. Since then, there was almost no war for more than two centuries. Can you believe, in, can you believe that uh, uh, any country uh, where there was no war for more than two centuries? That's a kind of miracle. That's why the, those castles are very clean and beautiful. Uh, I, I can say, ironically, that they are too clean to fight. And this is another system, uh, alternate attendance system. The feudal lords are asked to live in Tokyo, Edo, for one year, and then they are allowed to go back to their home country. Uh, one year and one year. In addition to that, they are expected to remain their wife and heir in Tokyo. They are like a hostage to show their loyalty to Tokuwa Shogunate. This shows how strong the control of the Tokuwa Shogunate over those feudal laws. Then, uh, uh, but they have to travel with some dignity. Uh, therefore, uh, there was an uh, unexpected side effect, which was that travel system became very easy. You know, you have to prepare a good roads, a good hotel system, of course, Japanese hotels. Uh, therefore, in Japan, in, since mid, uh, uh, say, 17th century, mid 18th century, it was possible for a single woman uh, from travel from Tokyo to Osaka alone, safely. That was impossible in Europe at that time. But they are expected to uh, kneel down and make bow to show their respect to them. At that time, as, as I said, uh, the, the, there was no major war in Japan, and also there was no major contact to outside of the world. Uh, I'd like to explain some exceptions. One was uh, Dejima in Nagasaki City, uh, where the only Dutch people, a few number of Dutch people are allowed to live here to engage in trade. That's not comfortable to live in this very small quarter. But they are willing to come to Japan to make money. And trade is, was very profitable. And then also they are expected to go to Yedo to show their respect to the Tokuwa Shogunate. Before uh, Yedo Baku, uh, the majority, the major power was from uh, Spanish and um, Por uh, Portuguese. But the Japanese leaders, like uh, uh, Tokugawa family, consider them dangerous because they are willing to establish Catholic uh, uh, religion to Japan. And then compared to them, Protestant people like uh, British and Dutch were interested in more money making than religion. So they thought they are safer. And they also wanted to know the Western civilization. That's why they allowed Dutch people only. You can see a national flag here. The, when the uh, Netherlands was uh, occupied by Napoleon, then it was, uh, there was only one place with this national flag of the Netherlands in the world. Uh, this is uh, the connection with Dutch. Another uh, connection was uh, with the Korea. The Korea had uh, uh, used to send a mission to Tokuwa Shogunate. Uh, whenever a new Tokuwa Shogunate uh, came to the power, and then they were, uh, uh, you know, they came with uh, dignity. And they traveled, uh, taking a few months from Korea to uh, Edo, uh, mixed with the uh, Japanese scholars. Uh, also, there are many Chinese merchants living. And actually, uh, they were, in terms of the number, they were more than Koreans and than uh, Dutch people. The major 
trade, trade item was books. They wanted to import many books from uh, China. And then some other things. You know, here is Ryukyu, Okinawa. Uh, you may know Okinawa. Okinawa has two names. One is Okinawa, which is a Japanese name. The other is Ryukyu. This is a Chinese name. Because, you know, Ryukyu, Okinawa was an independent kingdom uh, before, say, 17th century. But uh, 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 after, as an independent uh, kingdom, they uh, just made a tributal relations with China, in which they presented some goods to China and then to show their uh, respect to the Chinese emperor. And instead, the Chinese emperor uh, used to give them a huge amount of present, uh, tens or more times of uh, precious to them. So this is a very precious, uh, very uh, profitable trade system. At the same time, this is a system of uh, showing our respect, Ryukyu people's respect to uh, uh, China. And the Chinese emperor just pro promised that uh, he will protect you from other uh, danger. But this is just theory. Uh, this is a kind of a trade system, very profitable trade system. Because, you know, in early 17th century, Ryukyu was uh, occupied by Satsuma from here. And then uh, the, the there's only one way to decide who is really controlling this country. That's who has a, the power to taxation and also police. And tax and police were made by Satsuma. So this was a substantially uh, controlled by Satsuma, Japan. But Satsuma knew that the trade system was very profitable. So they just pretended that uh, they don't know anything about uh, their relation with China. And then, uh, then whenever the Chinese mission came to Ryukyu, they just hide, <laughs> and tried to hide themselves, and then uh, pretended that uh, Ryukyu was an independent uh, kingdom. Those uh, Ryukyu people, Okinawa people, used to go to Yedo to show their respect uh, uh, occasionally, once in a while. Uh, in order to explain the Edo political system, it is important to explain about emperor. Emperor, the origin of emperor may go back to fifth century of Japan. Uh, there are some uh, debate about the continuity, but theoretically it is believed to be uh, continuous today. But actually, in reality, there are a couple of three or four, uh, uh, you know, disconnection. But anyhow, the emperor used to live uh, in Kyoto, and then. Uh, they did not have any power at all, but they have uh, just authority. So the, uh, such shogunate, like uh, uh, Tokuwa shogunate, uh, wanted to uh, use this authority uh, to show their legitimacy. Uh, they did not uh, try to become a, uh, the emperor by themselves, but they just tried to uh, maintain this uh, the, uh, existence of emperor. You know, as I said, there was a peace for more than two centuries. Uh, I do not know any region or any countries which kept in peace for more than two centuries. And then there are a couple of uh, uh, things which I, I'd like to call peace dividend. One was population growth. The in, uh, uh, from 1600 to 1721, uh, within 121 uh, years, the population was roughly, uh, the minimum estimation was uh, 12 million, maximum was uh, 17 million. Uh, the, they differ very much. But there's an accurate uh, calculation of Japan's population, which was 31.2 million in 1721. Anyhow, this is a very rapid growth of population as a, a pre-modern society. And then, but since then, there was a minor growth from 1721 to early Meiji period. Uh, I'd like to explain later. And then this is uh, supported by the rise of the uh, rice po population. The, you know, feudal laws stopped fighting. Therefore, farmers could concentrate, concentrate on uh, cultivation. Therefore, they could get more rice. Uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, some picture. 
I once recently I made a visit to Madagascar in Africa, and I found that、uh, you know their their level of、uh, modernization was much lower than this one. And also,、uh, as a result,、uh, commerce developed very much. But a、uh, uh, more important piece dividend was increase of literacy rate. People became to be able to read and write. And of course, samurai people, the bushi or samurai people,、uh, there are many people who cannot read or write in early Edo period because their main job was fighting, not writing or reading. But toward the end of the Edo period, there was no feud, no samurai who cannot read or write, and then each、uh, feudal domain, each han provided education as in their respective han. But not only that, the、uh, the education expanded into other、uh, people. Like、uh, this is a、uh, uh, you know, of,、uh, this is called the Terakoya、uh, private elementary school. Where、uh, kids of、uh, you know common people learn how to read and write and then、uh, basic、uh, calculation.、Uh, it is estimated that、um, the literacy rate of the、uh, Edo period toward the end of the Edo period was around thirty、uh, to forty percent for adult male, and then more than twenty percent for adult female. It is. Pretty high in a pre-modern society, and it is said that if one out of ten can read and write, you can rely on the documents when you make administration.、Uh, you know, otherwise you have to tell, you have to、uh, rely on oral com communication. Uh, uh, therefore, the, in、uh, the administration based on documents, you can、uh, communicate very quickly. And also, you can tell the complicated uh, the, uh, message to the people. Also, there was a rise of a unique culture. This is,、uh, you know, some of the ukiyo-e, which had a strong impact on the French impressionists. And also, this is a unique culture of kabuki, classical Japanese dance drama. And、uh, if you have a chance, I'd like to recommend strongly that、uh, try try to read. Uh, enjoy this. This、uh, these are available on、uh, DVD or、uh, YouTube, probably. And then one thing I'd like to stress is that、uh, those ukiyo-e and kabuki are the culture of common people, of middle class. Then usually, in in most of the cases, culture arts are supported by king or aristocrats or big merchant, but they are supported by common people. As you can see here, common people are enjoying while drinking and eating. If I can make a comp comparison, this is somewhat similar to Shakespeare. Shakespeare was also supported by common people, but there was also negative legacy. One was that the no development of military technology, because there was no war,、uh, it was not necessary to make a development of、uh, military weapons. So、uh, you, you compare, you can compare the battle in Sekigahara in 1600, and also you can compare the the battles toward the end of the Edo period. The, the weapons are not very different, you know. No progress of weapons for more than two centuries. That's a、uh, you know unbelievable. And also the navigation technology declined also very much, because they, they, it was prohibited to go out from Japan. Therefore. In the 16th century, the Japanese people went to Southeast Asia quite often by the ship, but it is prohibited to go.、Uh, therefore, they had to,、uh, you know, navigate around the coast. That's it. Therefore, it declined. There, there was a big shock came, Opium War, in China. The Ch Japan knew that China was a great country, and then. Uh, that big country was defeated by British. The reason was terrible: export of opium, and then this is a totally unjustifiable war, in which China was defeated. That's a big shock to Japan. Then,、uh, after ten years, 
Matthew Perry came to Japan. Uh, he was sent by uh, the United States with uh, some squadron. They can, uh, some of them, or many of them are moved by steam engine. Therefore, they can go on. Even the window was blowing toward the, uh, the different side or in a rainy day. And that they could carry the big cannons in which they can shoot very far. Oh, therefore, Japanese people immediately understood that we cannot win over them. The, those people are formerly bushy, uh, whose uh, original job was uh, fighting. Therefore, they could know that it is unwinnable. Uh, therefore, Japan concluded a treaty. First treaty in 1854, and next, 1858, uh, another treaty was concluded with the United States and then on commerce, uh, amity and commerce. This was important. So the, the US, uh, and followed by other big countries, the uh, UK, Russia, uh, Netherlands, uh, they concluded a similar treaty. And then uh, Yokohama was opened as a city. Up until then, Yokohama was a very small village. Now this is the second big city in Japan. And then uh, Japan sent a uh, uh, maru uh, to, exchange, to exchange the instrument of the treaty. And then this was a Fukuda Yukichi. As I said, he's the uh, leading public intellectuals to understand Japan's modernization, who took the photo together with a girl in a Photoshop in San Francisco. But of course, opening of Japan after the closure of more than two centuries, that was a big shock to modern Japanese people. First of all, legal system was different. This was a picture of a Namamugi incident in which the, the parade of the, uh, the feudal laws was going on. In this case, people are expected to kneel down and bow to them. But uh, those British people, they are British people who are watching this parade on the horse. Uh, this is a, uh, you know, should be punished by uh, original traditional Japanese legal system. Uh, therefore, they just uh, killed and also injured some British people. Uh, of course, the uh, British did not accept this one and uh, they demanded a huge reparation and the punishment of the, those people who killed those guys. And also, uh, this was uh, in from Satsuma, the southern most uh, powerful feudal lord. Then the uh, uh, British sent their uh, fleet to Kawashima to fight with them. And then Satsuma was uh, relatively well prepared under the leadership of this Shimazu Nariakira, so they fought very well. And then some of the leaders of the uh, British fleet died. Uh, but anyhow, uh, within a few days, just they, they were defeated. The similar thing took place in Choshu, another strong feudal domain, uh, Yamaguchi, today's Yamaguchi prefecture. It was also uh, occupied by the British forces. Those two major possible opponents to Bakufu were, they just realized how strong the Western powers were. So they immediately decided to import their new military system from those countries. Uh, it was also decided by the Baku. This was uh, Tokugawa Yoshinobu, the last shogunate uh, in French army's clothes. Then, uh, uh, they wanted to uh, modernize the troops. What's the difference? You know, uh, the Japanese clothes are, you know, very loose sleeve and also loose pants which are not very good uh, to fight each other. Therefore, he wears this uh, slim pants, a slim sleeve, uh, and then, uh, well. But in terms of modernization of a uh, military system, Satsuma and Choshu uh, made more advancement rather than Tokugawa, because Tokugawa was uh, just headquarter of a uh, Tokugawa system, therefore, they had a lot of people uh, 
there are military systems organized uh, based on a class system. So the uh, higher level samurai had to be in a leading position. And then, but in, a, uh, in order to modernize the military system, the imp you have to import more new weapons from those countries. That's one thing. But also, you have to change the military system. In traditional system, the leaders are on the horse, which is likely to be the target of the gun. So you have to step down to the ground and nail. That was the way they have to fight. Then this system was uh, you, not easily accepted by the Bakfu, which had a more tradition and a more based on the class system. But compared to that, the changes was, uh, uh, took place more effectively in Choshu and Satsuma. That's why they became very strong. That they were supported by the Britain. And then, uh, as I said, this is uh, the picture of the last shogunate, Tokuwa Yoshinobu. And he came to realize that now it is impossible to shoulder all national politics by Tokuwa alone. So he decided to organize a council in which important, powerful uh, feudal laws may consist. And then uh, to shoulder the national politics. Up until then, it was a dictatorship of Tokugawa family or Tokugawa Bakfu. But he instead, he wanted to uh, uh, create a you know, council uh, consisting of those important, you can notice the Choshu and Satsuma included. Ichizen and Tosa are the uh, next important. Therefore, in order to do that, Tokugawa Yoshinobu decided to return to their prerogative to govern the nation, to the emperor, expecting, creating a council in which many feudal laws are participating. This is a picture of uh, Tokuwa Yoshinobu stating to his people that he will return his prerogative to the emperor. But uh, uh, Satsuma and Choshu, which are the opponent to Tokugawa Baku didn't like this idea. Because if this council were, was created, then Tokugawa is uh, definitely in a leading position. Because Tokugawa had accumulated a much uh, diplomatic experience with the Western countries, and they have a lot of assistance from France. Uh, in, while Choshu and Satsuma were supported by the British, then Tokugawa was supported by France. Uh, therefore, uh, though he decided to step down and uh, return the prerogative, but this is a kind of revolution, uh, a kind of coup d'etat, in which they decided that Tokuwa should be excluded from this system. And uh, this is uh, something Tokuwa cannot accept. Therefore, the war broke out in January uh, 1816. This is called as Boshin War. Boshin was the name of the year. And then this is a war between uh, the new government, which was formed in Kyoto, to Yedo. Tokuwa Yoshinobu himself, the last shogunate himself, uh, made a war here in, near uh, the suburb of Kyoto, and then was uh, defeated a little bit. Uh, that's not a major defeat, but he just uh, decided to make a surrender to Kyoto. And he came back to Yedo by ship. But he was surrounded by many people, and uh, many of them were not very happy about his decision. So they wanted to continue the resistance against them. Therefore, that's why Boshin War took place in uh, 1868 to 1869. The biggest war was in Aizu here. And then, uh, but uh, uh, remaining people just went to Hakodate, to Hokkaido. And then they, uh, they created uh, this castle to resist against the new government in Kyoto. The, but you can see the declaration of the restoration of the imperial rule was, uh, you know, uh, January. And they immediately followed by the Toba Fushimi battle. This was uh, the first of the start of the Boshin War. And then the 
Edo Castle was opened without any bloodshed. Then this was only three months. And also, uh, the, it took some time because the Bakru had more naval power compared to the new government. Therefore, that's why they tried to uh, uh, resist. But overall, it took only you know, one year and then four months. This is very short compared to other political changes in the world. This is the biggest question. Why Tokugawa did not resist? Why Tokugawa surrendered without making uh, uh, strong resistance? Uh, this is the uh, you know, biggest puzzle in Meiji Restoration. My idea is that Tokugawa Yoshinobu knew that if they could continue fighting against the Kyoto government with more support from France. But in that case, probably there would be a civil war that might continue for three, four, five years. And then with a strong support from France and Satsuma and Choshu are getting a support from Britain, then quite, I, I believe that during that process, probably Japan could be half colonized. You know, they may demand some you know, small island or some bay, or such as Hong Kong, as you see. And or they may want to uh, get uh, some control over some industry. Uh, France was very much industry, industry, interested in uh, taking over the silk industry uh, in, in Japan, which was very profitable. That's why Tokugawa Yoshino decided to surrender to save Japan as a whole. Of course, there is no uh, written evidence in that sense, but uh, you know, I cannot explain uh, without this hypothesis. I, I think this is the case. Then the Meiji state was established. Then uh, they just uh, introduced a surprising principle to the people. The Satsuma and Choshu are believed to be anti foreigners but actually they decided to open to Western civilization, and they decided to uh, say that they uh, will decide everything by uh, having the, the, the conferences. And everyone is allowed to speak to the government. We will decide accordingly. And then Western civilization was, uh, uh, began to be imported fully. The, that was the first year of Meiji. But more surprisingly, the biggest surprise took place in 1871. The fourth year of Meiji, which was abolished over feudal domains. You know, those leaders of Meiji restoration were from Satsuma or from Choshu. But they were backed by the strong power of the feudal uh, domains, but they decided to abolish them. Really surprising. And then, uh, I skip this one. And then in the same year, as I will tell you, uh, the top leaders of Japan, including Iwakura Tomomi, he was, uh, say, including the emperor, he was number three in the government. And also, this is Okubo Toshimichi, he was uh, almost a uh, de facto prime minister. And uh, Kido Takayoshi also was uh, very similar in importance. And this is Ito Hirobomi, who became the first prime minister later on. Those people led the delegation of uh, people, more than 100, went to see the United States and Europe. And then they traveled uh, for more than one year. And then the longest ones were the one year and nine months. And then, you know, is it possible to leave, uh, you know, important people, the form capital, after the revolution? It's, a, it's a really surprising. But they just wanted to know the Western modern, modern civilization by themselves. Other things are also important. Uh, they decided to uh, establish a modern industry. That, uh, this is Tomioka Silk Mill. This is uh, uh, now regarded as a world heritage. Then also they started to uh, uh, build 
uh, railway, which was completed in 1872. You know, in, uh, Southeast, in East Asia, the southern, Southeast Asian countries experienced the railway construction earlier than before because uh, uh, the railways were established by the Dutch people in Indonesia and also British people in Singapore and other places. But uh, Thailand uh, did the first railway in the uh, uh, 1890s or so, so Japan was much earlier than that because the railway pro construction was very expensive at that time. The another important thing was the education. They just decided to uh, have a, a, you know, particularly elementary education for everyone without classes. You know, as I said, in Yedo period, there was education for the uh, uh, bushi and also education for common people. They were mixed into one, and they decided to adopt the Western civilization as a basis. But, uh, you know, while those leaders are traveling abroad, and then they are remain, they are developed a gap between the remaining people in Japan and also those people who experienced foreign civilization outside. And then they broke out uh, on the issue of Korea. And the Korea was a you know, country, Japan had a diplomatic contact in Yedo period, but they did not accept any contact from Japan, saying that, uh, you know, Japan's government was led by emperor. And then the letter was sent by the emperor to Korea. But Korea said that there's only one emperor in the world, that's Chinese emperor. So we cannot recognize any other emperor. That's why they declined any contact from Japan. So this is uh, very much insulting. Therefore, we should take a tough measure against Korea, or we have to wait a little more. So there is a uh, conflict broke out between those two camps, and then the Saigo Takamori, who was considered to be the greatest hero of the Boshin War, just resigned and went back to uh, his home country. In this period, uh, I will uh, omit this part, but anyhow, uh, Japan tried to solve the issue of a territorial uh, conflict. The Japan sent some military expedition to Taiwan in order to solve the issue of uh, Ryukyu. Uh, you know, Ryukyu people were killed in Taiwan. Therefore, Japan had to do something uh, to show that Ryukyu people were Japanese people. And then they were successful in the negotiation with China. And also, they just tried hard to open the window of Korea. Finally, they did it. And then, treaty with Russia. This is something to do with, uh, you know, Polish people. You know, in, at that time, Japan was much weaker than Russia. Uh, up until this treaty, the Japanese people and Russian people are living together in this area, Sakhalin and then Kuril Island. They decided that uh, Japan will get Kuril Island and the Sakhalin uh, big island will go to Russia. So uh, this should be the starting point of a territorial negotiation between Japan and Russia, because this was concluded when Russia was very strong. And now, as you know, that Sakhalin is now Russia, and the Kuril Islands are under the control of Russia. But Russia is Russia, so there's no effective way to change their mind. Uh, I'll skip this one. And then uh, three years, uh, several years, uh, this is the 10th a ninth year of uh, Meiji. They finally decided to abolish the Bushi status itself. So they just cut the salary to the Bushi in order to save money. And the salary, Bushi was uh, deprived of their honor, privilege, and the economic income. So this was a terrible decision by the war, by the government. Therefore, there was strong uh, resistance against them, which was the, uh, uh, culminated by the Satsuma Rebellion. Uh, the, the Satsuma, which was considered to be the biggest, strongest uh, area, uh, just uh, stood up against the government, led by the war hero of Saigo Takamori, but was defeated. At that time, Okumoto Shimichi, who was uh, taking care of the government, insisted that Though we are in a war, 
terrible war. Still, peace is important. Industry is important. That's why we are going to continue the plan of a domestic exhibition, which was held uh, successfully in Tokyo Ueno. But because that was a very radical change, Oku was assassinated uh, in, the, uh, in the place uh, which is near, uh, some, some of you may know, New Otani Hotel in Tokyo. But this, was, this brought another change into Japanese politics, which is that the Satsuma, which was considered to be the strongest among feudal domains, was defeated militarily. Therefore, people came to understand that it's impossible to fight, to resist against the government by power. So let's rely on speech and the writing and so forth. And therefore, oh, this was the start of a freedom and people's right movement. <coughs> and then by so doing, it expanded into Tohoku area. Tohoku was a defeated area in Boshin War. And also, it was expanded into farmers. Because, you know, farmers do not fight. But still, they can join reading and writing. And therefore, the, the end of the Satsuma Rebellion uh, triggered the expansion of uh, freedom and people's rights movement, including the defeated area and also the non-samurai people. Then uh, the government, they came to say that uh, let's establish constitution in which people's rights should be protected. And also interestingly, the uh, government leaders also came to believe that we need constitution. And uh, Ito Hirobumi was a leading figure. And he went to, came to Europe and studied for more than one year, learning from Lorenz von Stein, professor of the University of Vienna, who was at that time the leading authority of comparative politics. And uh, he learned a lot, and he came to uh, write a constitution. And then eventually he wrote a constitution. Many people say, used to say that uh, Japan's Meiji constitution was a uh, authoritarian, and which did not allow the, uh, much of participation from the people. That's not the case. In recent studies, I believe that uh, this is more advanced than uh, had been believed. Because, you know, just look at the, the power of the lower house uh, to which common people can participate. The lower house power is very strong. They had the power to discuss and also occasionally the veto against the budget. You know, the budget, you, you can, no government can go on without the budget. So they had a veto against the, the budget. Then this is a very strong. So this, the Meiji constitution gave more power to the people compared to uh, the constitution of uh, Germany, uh, Prussia, uh, and other countries. Therefore, the foreign advisors to Japan opposed to this idea do not give, give them the veto power. Why did they give them the veto power? This is because they believed that, you know, without mobilizing the people's power, we cannot compete with Western powers. You know, in order to be equal or compete with Western powers, we have to mobilize the people's power. So let them come into the politics. That's the basic idea. That's a very different from uh, other countries. So this is a picture of an election. This is a, you know, first, uh, you know, speech in the first uh, parliament. This was in 1890. In 1898, the first party cabinet was established. Only eight years from the opening of the parliament. Uh, Okuma Shigenobu is known also a founder, as a founder of Waseda University, one of the uh, major private universities in Japan. And then it was impossible for Germany uh, in, in Prussian constitution, in the Prussian politics, you know, there was no party government until World War I. So this is the evidence of uh, uh, 
the more participation of the people was allowed in Japan's constitution. Of course, there are the, you know, uh, weak points in the uh, uh, Meiji constitution, which I will omit, uh, and uh, I may have a chance to speak later. Japan's, you know, uh, this is uh, Ishibashi Tanzan, the, one of the very great uh, journalists who became a prime minister after the war. He said that what's great about Meiji was not a war, not a colony, but democratization. Uh, we allowed people to participate in politics. That was the greatness of Meiji. And then it is, uh, I'd like to say that uh, in, in Japan, the modern history was uh, studied by the Marxist uh, uh, scholars in the in 1930s. And then there was a heated discussion whether Meiji restoration should be regarded as a establishment of the absolute monarchy or bourgeois revolution. But one scholar uh, came to say that this was uh, neither establishment of absolute monarchy or bourgeois re uh, revolution. But this is a revolution. This is something we should call revolution of nationalism. The nationalism, sense of nationalism inspired people and they get together to establish one nation. I'd like to say a few words about this one. As far as I know, the first uh, uh, documents uh, which touched upon Poland is uh, this one by uh, uh, Kajin no Kigu is the name of the book, and then this is uh, uh, the author. Yes. He was from Aizu, which was a defeated area in Boshin War. In other words, he lost uh, his uh, domain. And he went on to study in uh, uh, Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania University. And based on his uh, own experience, he wrote a novel. This is a novel, political novel. And there in Philadelphia, in the Independence Hall, before the Liberty Bell, he meets with the beautiful ladies from uh, Ireland and uh, Spain. This is not a love romance. This is a political romance, political novel. And they were both uh, fighting for their independence. The Irish lady was fighting for the independence, and the Spanish lady was fighting for the, uh, against the uh, uh, monarchy. And then uh, they just came to uh, say that we have to establish, re-establish our country. And that they are united with this promise. Then uh, uh, by chance, he, this is a very long story. And he made a trip to Europe once. And he came to Poland also, Krakow, stayed a few days. And then uh, he just explained his, his theory, why once great country of Poland was now occupied by foreign powers. And then, uh, of course, he, he did not have enough materials about that. But, uh, you know, people try to get freedom uh, forgetting the freedom of the nation. That's what he said. So this was uh, echoing the, you know, the nationalism, revolution of nationalism in Japan. And then he just became very sympathetic to those countries between the big countries such as Russia, Austria, Hungary, and Germany. And he proposed that uh, those countries from uh, Baltic area to Balkan area, including, of course, Poland, should get united to maintain their you know, independence. Uh, this is a uh, you know, theory, and then uh, based on uh, insufficient material. So I, I did not uh, go on uh, more. But still, at that time, there was a sympathy on the part of Japan. And then this was, as I said, this was based on the idea of nationalism. How to uh, compete with the Western powers by uniting national power. So this sentiment echoed to other countries. That's why I just tried to introduce this one. So this is about the time. So I will stop here, and then I'm ready to respond to your question. Thank you very much.
morning, everybody. Uh, can you hear me well? I will try my best with this microphone. First of all, it is my great privilege to thank you very much, Professor Kitaoka, for interesting lecture, selecting so important points in the history of Japan over close to 1,000 years and making fascinating observations. Authority, not power. Negative legacies, no military base. Maybe why at these days we say, if you want peace, you have to be ready for the war. That was not example. That was for 200 years, complete stability and relaxation, I would say. Very interesting, especially the, up to the point reaching the uh, final shape of constitution of Japan and impact of other nations for development of this uh, fascinating country. We always say we would like to be like Japan, you may recall uh, who said that uh, from our politicians, but I will leave the politics on the side for the moment. So one more time, thank you very much, Professor. It was very, very interesting. So uh, I suggest uh, we move now to the last part of the session which we call debate, and my role will be to moderate the session, to try to encourage you to ask questions, and of course, um, be very free and relaxed, and hopefully that will be interesting discussion. This is as much as I can say at the beginning, and um, how shall we proceed? Shall, shall we... Um, make few statements which will encourage to uh, ask questions because I, I, I think the questions may be related not necessarily to the history of Japan but maybe to the current situation which we are facing okay. in Europe yeah. and uh, facing in the geopolitical situation in practically not only in Europe but in the whole world. So. Uh, let me start and take a chance. Um, any of you would like to ask a question which Professor Tauka would be, I'm sure, happy to respond. Yes, we have the first, the first question from the floor. And yes, we have the second question. And I have one question in reservation. Here is a question. No? OK, please. Uh, throughout the years, Japan's goal uh, was to open to the West, uh, to uh, accept more trade, uh, to absorb some of the West culture. But then, uh, where was the turning point uh, where Japan, uh, when the Jap Japan's leader, Hirohito, closed the Japan uh, from the West? Uh, essentially, Japan was uh, isolating the, uh, their self. Uh, and uh, the whole process w was needed to the whole process of reopening for the West uh, was to I'm sorry <laughs> after Maybe, maybe. Okay, uh, uh, I just needed a moment for a translation, and uh, so uh, the question is why uh, Japan was closed? Uh, because uh, after the Second World War... I'm sorry, uh, my question... No, no, I'm sorry. My question was why Japan's direction from opening to the West, from opening to the West, came to nationalism and isolation? Uh, when was the turning point in uh, Japan's culture, in Japan's politics? Maybe that's clear. Okay, I will respond because this is a very big question. You know, that's uh, what I, I try to uh, uh, say if I had uh, remaining time. You know, the victory over Russia was a turning point. 
you know, Japan made a very difficult war with Russia and won in 1905. Uh, that was a great excitement for Japan. Japanese people made a great sacrifice for the war. But because of that uh, almost miraculous war, first of all, Japanese people became arrogant. We are invincible. We are strong. Yes. And that, uh, secondly, the, uh, the, there was a still, Japan was, uh, came to be regarded as one of the big five powers in the world after World War I. Still, there was a still discrimination from the West. You know, uh, Japan was uh, even among five, the fifth. And then when Japan proposed the, uh, the clause to oppose, to abolish the racial discrimination in the uh, peace conference in, uh, after the war, it was rejected uh, by Woodrow Wilson. Then uh, also the United States adopted a law which prohibited immigration from Japan to the United States. So there was underlying uh, dissatisfaction in Japan against the West. Uh, there came a Great Depression, and then that was a huge damage. You know, the, in many countries, uh, the GDP became just half or even below, and then they thought that the United States was uh, had a huge territory, rich resources, Great Britain even bigger, France had also one, but well, we, Japan, do not have uh, many other colonies, like uh, other than Korea. And, Taiwan. So, and also the government, which is the party government, was uh, uh, invited a distrust from the people. They were unable to control the nation, to lead the nation. Then the military went on to go on to Manchuria incident. And the militarily, they made a great success in Manchuria incident. That, uh, you know, with that, you know, civilians, party government lost their trust, and the military got their uh, uh, power, and uh, they got the, their trust, and then the world situation was uh, terrible. At that time, you know, the rising powers were considered to be Stalin's Russia, uh, Hitler's Germany. Therefore, uh, the time of democracy is gone. So there was a mistake uh, took place continuously. Then that's why basically Japan went on to the wrong decisions of making the war expansion. And then, uh, so this is uh, just a balance of, uh, you know, uh, party politics, civilian versus military. And uh, in, in this situation, if there had been no Great Depression, Japan would not have made into the war. Question. Yes, we have a student question. Okay, uh, I guess my question is. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, my question is uh, the history of the world in the 20th century was very troubled uh, with the Second World War, with the Cold War. And Japan was not really in a favorable position for the first half of it. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, how did it avoid um, becoming a pawn or a colony in such a tumultuous time? And so I didn't get, get quite well. To being a world I'm, power I right now. Oh. Uh, you have to speak a little bit louder if you can. <laughs> Sorry. Or closer to mic. Closer to mic, or <laughs> just louder. You are doing very well. Just enjoy. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm asking how did Japan uh, rise to the to being a global power uh, as of right now, considering its its unfavorable position at the end of the Second World War. Okay, okay. this was uh, another point I just wanted to explain. You know, Japan was defeated mainly by the United States, terribly. You know, you can compare Auschwitz and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah. You know, that's terrible. So the, the main purpose of the United States occupation was to make Japan safe country to the United States. So they just abolished, for example, the uh, uh, 
アビエーションスタディイン東京ユニバーシティ。そうだって、キャノットメーカー、エニーゼロファイターも。And then、uh, they just、uh, prohibited judo or kendo or s u m o because that's the basis of、uh, Bushido <laughs> they considered.、Uh, the peace constitution, so called peace constitution, in which the war was prohibited, not only war was prohibited, but military was prohibited in Article 9, second half. That is to make Japan safer. The, the main purpose of American occupation, American policy after 1945 was to make Japan and Germany safe against the United States. But we gradually, you know, under this、uh, policy, Japan,、uh, in a sense,、uh, you know, did not have to spend much money for military preparedness. Therefore, Japan could con concentrate on economic development. And also,、uh, Japan lost all the、uh, colony. That's why Japan could. Make trade with any other countries.、Uh, therefore, that's why we are successful in the time of Cold War. But after the, the Cold War, at that time, Japan was already the second biggest economy in the world. Japan had to play a more role to support the world order. That was tested in the Gulf War in 1990 and 1991, in which Japan was unable to do anything. But Germany changed their policy. So that they can join the activity beyond the NATO. And then、uh, still Japan is struggling from this、uh, you know, constraints by Article 9. So the,、uh, recently there h a s been uh, some uh, developments in、uh, security policy and foreign policy in Japan.、Uh, this can be called as a normalization of, uh, uh, from the、uh, The 1945 46, you know, to limit, to、uh, removing, partial removing of、uh, constraints set by the United States in 1945 46. Well, the, which is still very slow. Just compare what Japan is doing to help Ukraine. Just money. We, are, we just sent only helmets. How can you compare? Uh, this from the, with the Germany. Germany has made a gradual rise.、Uh, sometimes this is uh, uh, maybe a bit threaten threatening to the neighboring country. <laughs> but, but anyhow, Germany is becoming a normal power, while Japan is still remaining you know, a bit abnormal power.、Uh, that's why I think、uh, Japan should play a more active role in.、Uh, uh, Uh, world situation.、Uh, particularly, you know, Japan shares its own experience of、uh, modernization from non Western background. So, Japan is relatively trusted by the uh, uh, developing countries. Therefore,、uh, we, our responsibility is to make a bridge between the advanced country and the developed countries, such as in Africa and South, Af South Asia and so forth. By so doing, Japan can、uh, play a more important role、uh, in world、uh, affairs.、Okay. Do we have more questions from the floor? Oh, yes, we have here. Yeah, my question concerning the current situation in Poland, you said that,、uh, in Japan, you said that Japan has made a rapid Development in a really short time, and、um, I watched some videos on YouTube that、uh, Japanese people are、uh, they don't like such、uh, development because it makes them more、uh, like far away from their traditions and customs. What is your opinion concerning that situation in, in Ukraine, particularly? Sorry? It's, 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 His、yeah. question is about uh, that, uh, not escaping from tradition. Japan wants to maintain the tradition, not be influenced by the Western、uh, to the extent which will change that. This is how I understand. The, the relation between、uh, tradition and、uh, modernity is、uh, very complicated.、Uh, but think at the, at the begin beginning of the Meiji period, you know,、uh, Japan was very selective. For example, Japan invited many foreign scholars to teach in Tokyo University and other universities. In 
their respective language. At that time, the Japanese people are very good at English or French or German. Uh, but in one generation or so, they just switched to the former student of those professors. They started to teach in Japanese language. Uh, there were some people who argued that we should discard Japanese language to go to English, or let's uh, change to uh, convert to Christianity. But they are very minority. Fortunately, they were uh, just a minority. So uh, they, they just uh, went on. Uh, for example, we needed a new legal system at that time, because the legal system has to be very deeply rooted into the society. And then, but still we have to have uh, some common legal ground in order to communicate with Western countries. Therefore, uh, it took for Japan uh, 30 years to establish, to accept a new civil code based on Napoleonic code. And then it's so difficult because, you know, if we import some legal system and show the people, which was not uh, followed by them, exactly. that, that doesn't. So, uh, I, as I became the uh, president of JICA, I went to many developing countries and I saw that, uh, you know, many countries lost their religion, their language, mm -hmm. and uh, they are forced to accept the French legal system or British legal system over there. That's not uh, very good. So the Japanese people did their own effort. Uh, they are very selective. Of course, they made some mistakes, but the, the relatively speak, speaking, they were successfully selective. Uh, that's why they could accept the one. The uh, acceptance of uh, uh, Western civilization is not such a big issue after the war. And then uh, uh, the, the, uh, I think the, the big challenge was in early Meiji period. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? I can't see, so maybe Professor Wasilewski. I, I, I wonder, is there any relevance of, of religion in the, in the process of, say, modernization? Because in, uh, say, in European, uh, in, uh, like, the European, uh, in European uh, historiography, the origins of capitalism are very much linked with the spirit of, uh, and the spirit of capitalism are very much linked to with Protestantism. And uh, some uh, historians say, okay, it's just like the, these two things go parallel. Some others say that no, no, capitalism was invented in purely uh, uh, Catholic, Roman Catholic Italian cities like Genoa or in Tuscany. Uh, I wonder, it occurred to me during your lecture that you made no association whatsoever with all this uh, process of developing, say, capitalism in Japan and any, any religious, no Buddhism, maybe Shinto a little bit later on within the process of militarization of Japan, yes. But so any association of any links between religion and uh, all those social changes? Mm -hmm. and this is already very partially uh, pointed out by Max Weber that uh, some religion in Tokugawa period had something similar to the Protestant ethic. You know, the working hard in their own vocation had something to do with the uh, spirit of capitalism. And then, uh, uh, so I, I, can, uh, I can agree with this idea that not directly from Buddhism or not directly from Shinto, but uh, uh, the, there are many merchant people who just uh, just prohibited the, the, the gorgeous life, you just concentrate on your job and work hard. That will be the way to be saved in the future life. That was re relatively common in the Edo society. So this is, uh, in a sense, a basis of Japanese capitalism, which continues to, to, to present even. Any more questions? Yes, please. Oh yes, we have one more question from the student over there. That will be probably the last question. Uh, our time is almost over. Yes, please. Right, so the birth rate, uh, the fertility rate in Japan is pretty low. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there are not many migrants coming to Japan. And in that rate, the society in Japan will be pr pretty old uh, soon. 
how much, uh, how big of is it, uh, how, how big of a problem is it, and uh, how can uh, Japan's government uh, fight it? You know, uh, the Japanese politics is the most, uh, you know, uh, 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 least developed area in Japan. So the, uh, they are, I, I don't think they are uh, making a good decision on this issue. But basically, I can say that a couple of points are very necessary. First of all, to create an atmosphere in which uh, women can work easily uh, to have the baby and to raise their children. And then I, I can boast that it is successful in JICA, <laughs> you know. In, in JICA, last year we found that, uh, you know, uh, among the newly promoted uh, guys in their early 40s to the uh, section chief in Japan, uh, in, in JICA, which is an important post, 46.5% uh, are women. So they are just equal in early 40 years uh, of age. And then also, this is important, also to, uh, uh, in order to achieve this, we have to change the mindset of the men. You know, uh, I have to confess that I'm not a very uh, good supporter of my wife. <laughs> Anyhow, but still, now the situation is very much changing. The other important thing is how to accept the foreign people to Japan and to, uh, to stay there for long or uh, to stay for, for several years. And in this, also, Japan is very uh, much behind. You know, I'm very much uh, proposing to change the system. Uh, you know, just remember our history. In Nara period, in Nara age, in the 8th century, we had a lot of foreign people in Japan, uh, uh, from China, Korea, even uh, Persia. Then, uh, when uh, the biggest temple, still the biggest temple in Japan, Todai Temple was opened, there were uh, not only Japanese uh, Polish priests, but also there were three Polish priests, uh, one China, India, and Vietnam. So at that time, uh, Nara was a very international uh, capital. Just remember that age. And also in Sengoku warring state period of uh, 15th century, 16th century, uh, there are many uh, feudal lords who uh, converted to Christianity. And then there are a lot of influence from uh, the, uh, the foreign countries. So the, the closeness was created only in you know, Yedo period, which was partially open. But still, that mindset is still remaining. But we have to open more. And then as of now, we have a lot of people uh, coming the mainly from Southeast Asia. The biggest uh, uh, provider is Vietnam. Uh, from Vietnam to Japan, a lot of people are coming. And then uh, JICA has started under my leadership uh, a program to accept more uh, people from outside uh, more smoothly and with better support. And then recently I made a visit to uh, Madagascar in, uh, in May, and we started a program to invite more workers from uh, Madagascar to Japan. Uh, in, if this is successful, I believe this will be successful in a year or so, then Madagascar will be the first country to provide foreign workers to Japan uh, uh, from Africa. Uh, by so doing, though slowly, it is changing. But I'm afraid it's, uh, it's not enough <laughs> uh, smooth. And we have, we have to accelerate this process. I, I quite agree with you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to close this discussion. And uh, I'm sure that the lecture, the discussion, will encourage you to look closer to the Japanese history and development in Japan. It's really fascinating. And I would like to thank you, Professor. Thank you very much for coming and visiting us and offering us such a fantastic uh, thank food you. for thinking. Thank, thank you. you very much.